Hi, welcome to Ethereal Mechanics video number 15. This is the last in the Newton series. In this one we're going to discuss inertialist matter and then we're going to wrap up Newton's laws for use with Ethereal Mechanics. The audience here is people that have had at least a little bit of high school physics or at least understand some of the basic Newton's laws. Uh, this is, if you want to know more about me, there's the introduction video, video number one. Introduction. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to introduce inertialist matter uh, with some properties and we're going to introduce it with regard to Newton's laws. And we're going to wrap up Newton's laws between this and the past two videos. And we have a lot of teasers along the way that are very interesting. Teasers to give you a foreshadowing of what's coming in the later videos of ethereal mechanics. So what do quantum grease monkeys say about inertialist matter? Well, they say force divided by zero inertia is equal to infinite acceleration. And since everything is limited by the speed of light, that means inertialist objects move at the speed of light always. C is the symbol for the speed of light. What ethereal mechanics says is this. Consider this little block of wood here, a block of uh, inertialist matter called uninertium. Okay, I can't afford real uninertium right now. Um, what ethereal mechanics says is if I try to apply a force to this block, okay, it's going to move in front of my finger and I'm never going to feel it. I can't apply a force to it. And then if I stop applying force, it's just going to stop because it has no inertia. It can't keep in motion. So I will never feel it. It's just going to move out of my way, just like empty space moves out of my way. And I will never feel it. But it does not travel at the speed of light because you cannot apply a force to something that has no inertia. Therefore, you cannot get infinite acceleration. But that doesn't mean it can't move at the speed of light. We'll discuss that later. So the question is, is force a cause or effect? Well, it's, we're not going to really answer that here, but uh, if you consider a, a classic second order system, uh, we add up the inertia, the friction, and the spring of a block, a, a traditional second order system, but we sum all the forces, they equal to zero, and according to Newton's third law, or is it Newton's second, I can't remember, um, if all the sum of the forces equal zero, it'll stay, uh, there won't be any acceleration, but this system does in fact move, can move it as if it's energized. So there's a little no more contradiction there, but we discussed the inertia in the previous one. The inertia is where the lag is to cause the imbalance, to allow the motion. Uh, that was in the previous video. But anyway, if we take out these individual components and look at them separately, okay, we find that inertia, the force of inertia is opposite to the acceleration of the object. We find that the force of friction is opposite to the velocity. The direction of the force, of frictional force, is opposite to the velocity of the object. And we find that the force excited on a spring is opposite from the force displacement of the object from its steady state. So we only get these forces when things are disturbed, which is a kind of an interesting realization. But we're going to go on from there. So let's look at ethereal mechanics with respect to this system. Let's take a spring here. Uh, call an inertialist spring, and we're trying to, uh, we're going to accelerate three different types of masses: styrofoam, brass, uranium, and uninertium. Well, if we, and this is an airless vacuum on the surface of the Earth, so if we put the very light styrofoam ball on, the very light styrofoam ball, because it's not going to be retarded by the the, the air friction, is going to have end exit with the greatest velocity, and it's going to end up far away. Brass will be next and the uranium cannonball will travel the least distance. But we don't know what's going to happen to the uninertium cannonball because when you try to divide force by a zero mass you get that strange thing that you get with quantum mechanics. And that's why quantum mechanics is silly. Is in quantum mechanics we cannot ignore the fact, in, in, in real life world, we cannot ignore the fact that the forcing function of something has inertia too. So. There is no such thing as a perfect or inertialist force. There is no such thing as an inertialist spring. There is no such thing as an inertialist field. Remember video 14, if all fields are self-contained, then all fields contain energy. If all fields contain energy, then fields must have inertia. Try defining energy without inertia. Otherwise, fields would violate Newton's third law. So, the forcing function, if we give a forcing function Okay, if we consider the mass of the spring as well in this, then we have no problem. 
Okay, again, the styrofoam balls can travel the furthest, followed by the brass, followed by the uninertium and the, uh, I'm sorry, the uranium, and the uninertium is just going to fall straight down to the ground. Okay, and now we have a nice continuum of outcomes. If we had other masses, we could fill positions everywhere along from uninertium out to styrofoam, but it's kind of backwards. Shouldn't styrofoam be closer to the uninertium? Why do we go from zero mass to heavy mass to lighter? It's kind of backwards. And the other question is, why does uninertium fall? Well, we have to learn a second thing about uninertia. Inertialess particles do not react to force. They move in the direction of a force. Their velocity and acceleration will match that of the forcing function, the spring, the field, whatever. Okay, we're going to talk much more about that. But once the force is removed, uninertium stops. Okay, this is different from quantum mechanics where inertialist particles always travel at the speed of light. But in a gravitational field, uninertium will fall toward the massive body. It's not accelerated, it's really just moved, and we'll talk about that later. When we, when we talk about what gravity is, it'll make more sense then. Okay, now let's consider an incredibly massive spring, like the kind of spring they used to stop locomotives with. Okay, such that the mass of the spring is so much heavier than the mass of all the different cannonballs we're trying to accelerate. Okay, because the inertia of the cannonballs have very little effect, we can kind of ignore them. And all of the balls with inertia are almost going to fall in the same place because they're going to end up with almost the same velocity and therefore they're going to hit the earth at the same place. But now we've lost the continuum. We no longer have a nice continuum. Is there any way we can make something fall into the gap in here between so we can get our nice continuum back? The continuum is a very interesting thing. Well, we can do that by considering friction. Okay, we have by putting air. Now we have air in our simulation and we, we have the coefficient of friction times the velocity. Now we have more another way to lose energy. In this way, our continuum, we get our continuum back Okay, but it's more normal now. Now we have the lighter object closer to the uninertium and the heavier object farther away. That seems to be more satisfying. Okay, so we have to ask ourselves, well then is a vacuum frictionless? Well, in video number five, Olber's paradox argued that space is not a perfect conductor of light. Light will eventually lose energy. I tried to compute the losses from uh, galactic observations, but there was just too much filth to get a, any kind of realistic reading. There's another way to do it, which will be explored later. Unfortunately, that new way requires us to believe in the aether. I really wanted to do it this way so I could have a way of doing it that before being required to believe in an ether. But even then, when you go back to the Olbers paradox, you'll have to agree that the night sky should be much brighter than it is, which means there has to be losses to light. Okay, so if light loses energy, and energy is inertia times velocity squared, then mass translating through space should also come to a rest with respect to the medium of space, which we will call the ether. So, and this is going to be hard for a lot of people to swallow. The universe, most of the mass in the universe, and I mean massive objects like black holes, planets, whatever, are already at rest with respect to the ether right now. They're in motion, but they're at rest with respect to the ether. Sounds confusing. It'll make more sense when we start developing the ether model later. Uh, anyway, this realization eliminates the need for dark matter to make our stupid equations balance, and it also solves the problem of the Michelson-Morley experiment. So, if ether is does act on a body, okay, and, and objects moving through the ether will eventually lose energy, then in the vacuum of space, we still have our nice con continuum. Given that we have a massive, supermassive spring, and everybody exit with the same velocity, the uninertium will stop at the farthest extent of the spring. The styrofoam will, will go, this may be, I don't know, a hundred light years before it stops. This may go, you know, a million light years, and this may go a billion light years before it finally stops relative to the ether. But we'll have a continuum. Okay, the third lesson learned. No object can move faster than the force which is accelerating it, the forcing function. For, and can I ask you a question, do any of the ball cannonballs ever move faster than the spring? No, absolutely not. Since the fastest known field travel at the speed of light, and I say known, then velocities beyond C should be impossible. And again, that's with known fields. 
This is why inertialist particles max out at C according to present theory. Uh, this is a much more sensible logic than the quantum mechanic derivation I showed you at the beginning. Uh, this is also a much more sensible reasoning than Einstein's reason for the speed limit. Okay, here's a teaser number three. If we go back to video number four, we learn that light is consistent with all other no uh, known wave phenomena. Light is a transverse wave. But in order to sustain transverse waves, a medium must support longitudinal waves at a much higher velocity. This is the basis for ethereal mechanics model for light, which we'll get into in a later video. But one day, I'm telling you right now, humans will travel to the stars far beyond the speed of light. So the new wrap-up of Newton. In the following slides, we're going to introduce, uh, we're going to refactor Newton's laws to bring them into conformance with ethereal mechanics. Newton's first. Okay, there is no such thing as a perpetual motion. I will say that again. There is no such thing as perpetual motion. We should know that because no one has ever developed a perpetual motion machine. All energy must eventually dissipate. So, too, should the kinetic energy of a body in motion, or the energy of a field, or the energy of a wave. Given a short enough time frame, however, given a short enough time frame with respect to the inertia of a body, then Newton's first, as originally written, is useful. Of course, this is important because if you have an inertialist body, then you cannot use Newton's first law because there's no inertia. Newton's second. There is no such thing as a perfect force, which means that every forcing function has a velocity limitation which limits the acceleration achievable. Thus, trying to divide a force by a mass is too simplistic, too simplistic to determine resultant acceleration. The only truth is that the inertial reaction force is equal to force times minus the inertia times the acceleration. In other words, when you accelerate a body, the inertial reaction is going to be opposite to the direction of acceleration. That's the reason for the minus sign. The third, since all interactions between particles are affected by fields, then the rule of balanced emission, video number 14, supersedes Newton's third. For engineering problems where field velocities are substantially faster than the velocity of the objects being modeled, then Newton's third, as originally written, can be useful. Only an approximation, though. Here's tease number five. Remember we just showed that the inertial force of an object is minus the inertia times its acceleration. And this is the new induction model. This is from the version three models. We're going to introduce that in one of the later videos. I can't remember if it's this video or the video after. This was found by experiment. This isn't a dream. This isn't made up. This was found by computer search of real experimental data, and I'll show you how that came about in that video. So if we set these two equal to each other and divide through by the common items, we get that inertia is equal to a constant times char charge squared divided by distance. So let's do this. Km is equal to mu over 4 pi, which is 1 times 10 to the minus 7, in case you can't see that from the video. And let's substitute for Qs and Qt, excuse me, the charge of an electron, which is 1.602, blah, 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 times 10 to the minus 19. And then for R, we'll substitute the classical electron radius, which is 2.187, blah, 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 times 10 to the minus 15. By the way, these little parentheses here mean that these digits are, 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 are approximate. So we're only sure on um, these out to this digit, and therefore Km, we're out to 11 digits. Little re, I believe we're 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, we're out, good out to 11 digits, and measured charge is good out to 10 digits. Okay, so if we plug these values into this equation and solve, we get 9.1093829142914 time kilograms. That's the inertia of an electron computed from purely electromagnetic means. Now if we look at the measured value for the mass of an electron, we only have it out to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 digits. But we can calculate it electromagnetically out to 10 digits. So I've improved science by one whole digit. Thank you very much. Okay, just for your information, Henry Poincaré in 1906 argued that mass is the product of the electromagnetic field in ether and they spelled ether with an A back then. 
implying that no real mass exists. So what it really means is inertia. And once you say inertia, you don't have to say no real mass exists. That's all you need for theoretical mechanics. Fortunately, he couldn't do it because they had a bogus model of uh, electromagnetic induction, which really isn't all of Maxwell's fault, but you need somebody to blame. And because when Einstein came out with his stuff, he solved a lot of questions, so people just kind of ignored the whole question of the ether, and that we've been stuck in this rut ever since. When I was a kid, they told us we'd be pretty, and back in the 70s, we had every belief we'd be standing on the shores of a distant star by now, and where have we gone? So what's next? Next video is the antenna paradox. Uh, that is a very short video, but a very interesting video, where we're going to look at some properties of light by studying antennas, and a, and a paradox in antennas. Uh, we're skipping 17. We don't need to disprove Faraday, because we're going to show you how uh, the new induction model was derived from experimental data, and we're going to show you how that led to a better magnetism model. Again, these are the V3 models in ethereal mechanics. We're going to show you the version 5 models. Version 4 models were from my graduate thesis. Where all, I added, all I added was uh, some better definitions for energy. Uh, one of the things that Maxwell had right is that magnetic fields are kinetic energy and are related to kinetic energy and electric fields are related to potential energy. That was correct. That was lost when Heaviside converted his models using the new vector math of the day. Uh, then we're going to do some this. Then this begins ethereal mechanics improper. We're going to start the derivation of the properties of the ether using reciprocal thinking. And then the most important video in 15 minutes. This video is going to use the cannonball. And in this short 15 minute video, I'm going to show you the quantum mechanics, string theory, relativity, and the Big Bang Theory are all wrong. You don't want to miss it. And I'm going to show you that matter is not a perpetual motion machine. Just like I showed you that light and objects moving in space are not perpetual motion machines, neither is matter. Thank you very much. Oh, yes, please. I thank you people that are donating, and if we can get some more donations, that would be great. I could really use some more equipment.